Well, good morning. How is everybody? Good. Glad I heard everybody's, they're doing well. So <laughs> I'm doing well too. Um, I want to welcome you, especially we have a lot of people that are watching online right now and we're glad that you can join us and we're thankful for technology. We're thankful that we can still broadcast our church services through uh, so many different avenues and people can join us at home and so you're still part of our church family even though you're physically not here uh, we know and, and, and recognize that you're at home so how many of you are thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ amen yes Jesus is our assurance isn't he he's our hope he's our peace our wisdom Jesus is our truth He's our guide, and I'm so thankful for him. And I want to let you know today that this gospel that we proclaim is for everybody. There's no, uh, no man or woman alive that it is not for. The gospel doesn't look at your bank account or your job title to gain acceptance. The gospel is for everybody. It doesn't um, go against what... Um, what you have together in your life if it seems like you have everything put together or that you're hanging on by a thread this gospel is for you and I don't know about you but the last five months I'd say most of us feel like we're hanging on by a thread this gospel is for every race every male every female regardless of your political party and this gospel is for those that even want nothing to do with God at this point in their life, the gospel is still for them who are living in opposition of the kingdom of God. This gospel is for every person. So we've been in a series titled Minor Characters and we're looking at individuals who uh, maybe don't get the headlines like we would typically read about some of the major players in the Bible, but they have a significant impact and significant influence on the pages of the Bible that we read. And so today we're going to look at Barnabas. And now some of you may say, well, Barnabas maybe wasn't a minor player in the Bible. He had quite a bit to do and, and that's fine, but this is my moment. So I'm talking about him. All right. So tough. <laughs> so but Barnabas, he had been changed by Jesus in the sacrifice of Jesus. And be, because of that change, he lived a, a life that was full of the Holy Spirit. He preached the gospel. He witnessed to so many. And because of that, he was able to see so many people change for the kingdom of God. And so I'm asking you today to make yourself available to God. Not just today, all right? Some of you think, okay, in just a few minutes we're going to pray and I'll make myself available then. No, no. Available, your life available. Today, tomorrow, in a week, in 10 weeks, whatever it may be, to make yourself available. And I'm also saying and asking that you would live a life that is full of the Holy Spirit. That is what we need. We need to be people of the Spirit. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. We need to live by the Spirit. And, uh, and that's what we need. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word that is so powerful and so rich. Our hearts and our minds are open up and ready to receive from you today. May we once again be filled up with the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're thankful for the transforming power of the gospel of you, Jesus. And may that not just be for this group here or watching online. May we realize this is for every person. We love you and we thank you. In your wonderful name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So when I think of the book of Acts, I think of Paul. Don't, m most of you would think Acts synonymous with Paul, which is true. I think of uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how that fueled the early church and the spreading of the gospel. That's, that's typically what we think. But as you, you read and you study and you look deeper into the book of Acts, you'll read stories of how the gospel went forth and maybe one mention of someone's name and how they were a part of that. Or maybe they're not even mentioned at all. One, one of the things that my eyes were opened up to this week is in, I believe in chapter 11, where the gospel went to Antioch, intentionally went there to the Gentiles, intentionally taken there when it hadn't been done so before. And the Bible mentions no names. 
just regions of where these people were from. But yet that story in that moment in, in the history of the early church was so powerful and so transformational of the spreading of the gospel to every person, not just those who were close to Jerusalem at that time. And so those, those are the kind of people that when I get to heaven, I want to talk to them too. Like, we don't know who they are. I've, we're going to have to search them out, but good thing we've got eternity to talk to people and find out like, what happened? Tell me more about this going to Antioch. So when we, we read about Barnabas in the book of Acts, he is mentioned, I think, 25, 26 times in the book of Acts. But he doesn't usually make the headlines like Paul does or Peter does. And so, uh, in your Bibles, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 4, we'll start with verse 36. Very short, simple verse. But this is how we're introduced to Barnabas. Barnabas in verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So we find out that Barnabas actually is Joseph. That's his, his real name, his, his given name. Um, but the disciples, they give him this name Barnabas. And it's like a, a surname, like an additional name, a nickname uh, per se that is Barnabas. And from this point on, as we read, we read about Barnabas. We don't read about Joseph any longer. Um, and from what we see, so he's called son of encouragement. Uh, when, you, when you read about him, think of this, son of encouragement. And how is he encouraging people? Uh, because it's true. And he fits this description. So when you see, you know, that son of... Um, it was often used to indicate someone's character or someone's nature of who they are. And some of you maybe would be titled uh, an encourager today. And so they called him uh, Barnabas, son of, of encouragement, and it stuck. Some of you have a nickname you've been given, and it stuck. Whether you like it or not, you've got that nickname. This is Barnabas now, all right? So Barnabas, he's this great example. One that, that I believe each and every one of us can learn from, and I pray that we can. We may not be like Paul. We may not be like Peter that is outright and bold and just standing on a soapbox preaching in a sense. We may not have that personality, but I really believe that we can all be like a Barnabas. We can have a ministry of encouragement, and that starts with being full of the Holy Spirit. And so if I were to describe Barnabas to you today, here's a few things that I would say. Number one is this, that he was generous. He was generous. So um, back to 436 in the book of Acts. We'll jump to 36 and 37. I want to read it to you again. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field that he had owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas, we hear and learn that he is a Levite. Now back then, the Levites typically did not own land. That was one of the things that they were just known for. They typically were not allowed to have land. And so somehow, I don't think he broke the law, but somehow he acquired land. The Bible doesn't really say how, but he, regardless, he had it. And he sold it. And he gave the money to help other believers, other people. And this was such an important part in the history of the church that it records it. And I think for several reasons. Um, one of the reasons would be is if you read chapter 5 later on today, you'll read about two individuals that tried to do the same thing but tried to be sneaky about it and they paid uh, a dear cost for it. So I think it was setting an example for the early church of living a generous life. Think of Barnabas, the love of Jesus had transformed him. The love of Jesus had compelled him to live this generous life. What he gave was sacrificial. We don't know the amount, but we know that if, if he had land and he sold it and he gave it, that was a sacrifice. That was a big offering because he wanted to help people. He wanted to bless people. This was so valuable and so important. His sharing along with others that had done so at that time, this was not a result of leg legislation. See, it's not the government's job to do that back then, and it still isn't now to force giving. This was benevolent. Out of his heart, he gave. This was spontaneous. This was voluntary that he gave in order to help people 
benevolent hearts motivated the early believers to share. And even though the situation and the circumstances may be different for us today and in this moment, the New Testament clearly teaches us that we are to help others who are in need. And I can gladly tell you that New Hope does that as a, as a fellowship, as a church, we're benevolent. We're doing what we can, not only to help missionaries and people overseas, but right here and people just a few blocks from us. The Urbandale Food Pantry, so many opportunities that we're, we're trying to get our hands on if we can and be wise about it and be benevolent because we want to bless people. And I, I, know, I know that and you're a part of this church and I say thank you for being a part of that. But it's from a benevolent heart. It's from a blessed heart that we do that. So let's be generous with what God has given us, with our tithe, with our offering, supporting missions. This was, like I said, a sacrifice that Barnabas gave, and I believe that God blessed him and he used him. But I want to step back just a moment and say that being generous is beyond just money, all right? We can be generous with our money, but we can also be generous with our time, can't we? There's 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, 12 months in a year. And that's something that each and every one of us has been given by God. We can be generous with that. Let me give you a couple examples. A derecho hits and it hit hard. We can be generous with our time. Your time helping someone clean up is valuable. There's students that have gone back to school or going back to school. They might be stressed out or they're worried about life at home. Your time listening to them is valuable. There's people who have moved here from other countries and they're looking to make connections. They want to be connected not only with people from their own country but from here in the United States. Your time helping them make connections is so valuable. We can be generous with our time. Think about this, the last month you will never get back again that time. Some of us will say, I hope I never have to get it back again, right? But think about this, you'll never get it back. How did you spend your time? Were you generous with your time? We can also be generous with our words. If you've been hurt or put down by someone's words, raise your hands. You've been hurt or put down by someone's words, raise your hands, all right? If you've been loved or encouraged by someone's words, raise your hand, yes. There's that saying that goes, hurt people, what? Hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people, in essence, Someone who's been hurt is more likely going to go hurt someone. And in this context, you've been hurt by someone's words, there might be a, a greater chance that you're going to go and hurt someone else with your words. But on the other side of the coin, I say this, loved people, love people. Loved people, love people. You've been loved by someone's words, you're more likely, hopefully, to go and love someone with your words. See, the Bible says that we have the power of life and death in our tongue. The power is there. We can bring destruction or we can build up and encourage. We can tear people down or we can bring encouragement. We can bring defeats or victory, all by the power of the words. Let's be generous with our words and encourage people. Barnabas lived this. Barnabas did this. And there is a lot of discouragement in our world today, isn't there? The last five months have been very difficult for so many people. People are depressed. People are lonely. Marriages are breaking apart. Let's be generous with our words and encourage people because we have the Spirit of God within us. There are believers, listen to this, there are believers that are discouraged. Maybe some of you today, you're discouraged. You want to throw in the towel of your faith. The last five months have been very difficult. Let's be the body of Christ and let's encourage with our words and be generous and lift people up and help people. Think of Barnabas. In Acts chapter 11, he goes to the early church in Antioch, the one that the no names went to, the, the nameless pioneers preached the gospel. He then goes after them and goes and encourages them. And here's what he, he talks about. He, he encourages them to remain true to the Lord with all of your heart, he says. Remain true to the Lord with all of your heart. He recognized that as new believers, they needed a voice in their corner. They needed that someone that would stand up for them and cheer them on in their newly founded faith. And so I say to the church today, new hope, 
Don't give up in your faith. Listen, if you're discouraged today, do not give up in your faith. Remain true to Jesus with all of your hearts. Even when the world is turning its back on God, remain true. Now more than ever before, we need believers who are committed to God. We need believers who are committed to the word of God. We need believers who are committed to prayer. If you read throughout Acts, almost everything that took place, it talks about them spending time in prayer. We need to be committed to that. Don't quit, church. It may seem like the easiest thing to do because you're facing this uphill battle. But I want to remind us today that the weapons that we fight are not carnal, are not of this earth. It is a spiritual battle that we are in. And we need to remain committed and focused on Jesus Christ and the, the, the mission that he has set before us. Do not quit We need to rely upon the commander of the the armies of heaven to fight for us. Do not fight this alone. And so I say that to all of us here today. Do not quit in your faith. Barnabas, another thing about him is he believed in people. He had this knack for seeing potential in someone and being willing to step up for them and to, to encourage them. He would call people out from the sidelines and kind of thrust them into full-time action. Here, let me give you a couple examples. He, he believed in Mark. So early on in one of the, the early journeys of Paul and Barnabas on the missions that they would do, the trips that they would do, they brought along Mark. All right, so they're traveling, they're, they're witnessing, they're preaching, and the Bible tells us that Mark just left. We don't know why, we don't know what happened, doesn't describe it, just that he left. And that clearly did not set well with Paul, because if you fast forward to chapter 15, Barnabas and Paul, they're getting ready to go on another journey. They're getting ready to go revisit some of those places that they had just been to encourage the church and continue to preach. And, and they're, they're gearing up, they're getting ready to go. And Barnabas says, I want to bring along Mark. And Paul says, absolutely not. That guy left us. He, 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 there's no way I'm going along with him. Uh, there's hard feelings there because of what had happened. And it, the Bible tells us and talks about how it was such this sharp disagreement that they actually decided to go their separate ways, Barnabas and Paul did. They, they like mutually agreed to go continue to preach, but they weren't going to be together because Mark was there. And I have to wonder if Barnabas maybe got, got it right because later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, he's writing to Timothy and he says, would you please bring along Mark? Why? Because he says he's helpful to me in ministry. So Barnabas saw something in Mark and stood with it, even to the point of saying, listen, we're going to agree to disagree and that we're still going to go preach the gospel, but I'm going to take him with me. Barnabas also believed in Paul. You know, before Paul met Jesus, he wasn't the nicest guy, was he? He hated Christians. He wreaked havoc on the church. He arrested them. He threw them in jail. He oversaw the stoning of Stephen. He hated them. And now all of a sudden, on a road to Damascus, he meets Jesus, his life is transformed, and he begins to preach the gospel. The same gospel that he was so opposed with a few years prior. Now all of a sudden, he's there. And so guess what? The new believers, they were skeptical, weren't they? They didn't believe him. No way. They thought he was a spy. They thought he was just infiltrating them in order to arrest them. So they were skeptical. Not going to lie, I'd be skeptical too, wouldn't you? I mean, if the guy's overseeing the death of Christians, absolutely. But Barnabas, when everybody else was skeptical, Barnabas saw something. He saw the transformation in his life, and he willingly stepped up for Paul. I want you to to notice in Acts chapter 9, jump ahead a few chapters with me. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 26. Here's what... Barnabas does. When he, meaning Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really the disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached 
fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. So when the brothers, now those that are convinced, learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. When others saw him as a spy, Barnabas insisted on believing that he was genuine. Listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to give people a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. We have to be able to see what God has done in their life and say, you know what? I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I see change in your heart. We have to be like that. We have to be like Barnabas and and give encouragement to people to remain true to Jesus. Listen, when someone turns their life over to Christ, we as a body of believers, as the body of Jesus Christ, we need to be like Christ. We need to help them. We need to stand up for them. When someone walks away from their faith in Jesus, we shouldn't write that person off and just assume that all hope is lost. We need to stop with judgmental attitudes. We need to be able to see that person and love them. Why? Because Jesus showed that same kind of love to you. That's what's happening in our world. We need to be full of God's spirit, full of grace and truth, which is what has been shown to us. Remember this, some of you, you've walked away from God. And guess what? He pursued you still. Remember that. We need to be like Barnabas, see potential in people, believe the best in people, stand up for people that are new in their faith, that are struggling in their faith. Treat them with kindness and love because that's what's been shown to us through Jesus. Finally, Barnabas, he was full of the spirit and faith. Turn with me to Acts chapter 11. A short description of Barnabas, but it's so powerful. Acts 11 verse 24 says, he, meaning Barnabas, was a good man. He is full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Barnabas was filled with the Spirit, which I believe explains the effectiveness of his ministry. It's evident that he was full of faith because he believed in in the church in Antioch and so many other churches. He believed in Mark. He believed in Paul. He was full of faith. The Spirit did give him power to preach and witness, but I believe it was his life that spoke loudly to everybody that he met. Everybody. And so I say to us today, we need to be full of the Spirit. We need to be full of faith so that our lives point to Jesus. That's what we need to be full of is the Spirit. Think of this. A full life can also mean a devoted life. Barnabas was devoted, wasn't he? He he was almost fearless in what he was doing and where he was going and encouraging the church because he lived a devoted life. His time, his heart, his energy, living a full life for us, a devoted life, starts with living a holy life, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is what? Holy. So we need to live a holy life. We have to be able to extract and ask God to remove the things in our life and in our heart that are not holy, that are not a part of Him, and so that we can make more room for God and more devoted life for God. Galatians 5, 16 to 26, I'm going to read this to you. This is evidence of a Spirit-filled life. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you, you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Listen to this. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But listen, the the evidence of of, of a life that is full of the Spirit, this is some of it right here, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, they've crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. 
Verse 25, I love this verse. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We can't keep in step with the Spirit if we're not full of the Spirit. We can't keep in step with the Spirit if we're preoccupied with the things of this world and not on the kingdom of God. Too many Sunday Christians get their fill on a Sunday morning, and that's it. That's like eating one meal a week, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I can't eat one meal a week. I'm too cranky, and I'm not fun to be around if I only eat once, right? Some of you are doing the same thing. You're judging me right now, but you're the same way, all right? Why would we do that? We, we, we need multiple meals a day, every day, in order to fuel our bodies physically. So why do we treat our spiritual life this any different? We're consumed with so many other things rather than the things of God. And they're not necessarily sinful, but the Christian life is more than coming to church on Sunday mornings. The Christian life is living and following Jesus Christ every day. Getting your fill right now is not sufficient. This is important, but it's not enough. You're going to need the Spirit of God in a few hours, right? You're going to need the Spirit of God tomorrow morning when you go back to school or to work and you face difficult situations. You need the Spirit of God to fill you. The gospel is meant to be told to everybody, but how can it go forth in power? How can the gospel go forth in authority if we are preoccupied with everything else except for God? How can it? We need to be able to be filled with God's Spirit. So I ask you, what is filling you? What is filling you? The early church, they lived devoted lives. They were persecuted, all right? They were, we read about how the church was persecuted and spread out. And so on the the negative side, yes, they faced persecution. But on the positive side, guess what happened? The gospel spread. It was a blessing. It was intended. It was planned. The gospel spread because they lived devoted lives full of the Spirit. So I ask us, think about this. What could things look like if the church, not just New Hope, but the church across the globe lived devoted lives full of the Spirit. What, what could it look like? What would happen if that was the case? Not this one-time filling of the Spirit, but a constant ongoing filling, like the Bible says, of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need today, isn't it? We need that. Here's why. Because there's a lost and dying world that's headed to hell. We know the answer, don't we? It's Jesus. But if we're preoccupied, if we're not filled, or we're constantly being filled with the Spirit of God, we're going to be losing our focus. All the while, people are headed straight for destruction. So I ask you, what is filling you? Worship team, would you join me? Think of Barnabas. He was generous, right? We talked about him being generous. I believe he was generous because of the generosity of Jesus that showed him. Jesus willingly and sacrificially laid his life down for Barnabas and and every one of us. And I think Barnabas was able to be generous because of what had done. Barnabas was able to see potential in people. He was able to believe in people. Think about this because that's what had been shown to him. Uh, He had been transformed by God's power and God's love through Jesus, and he wanted that for every person. That's what Barnabas was able to do. Barnabas was able to be effective in ministry. Barnabas was able to do what he did because of the Spirit of God that was within him. And church, we need that today, don't we? We need the Spirit of God every day. So I ask you, are you available to God? Not just right now and we're, as we're about to sing and pray. Not just now make yourself available, but does your life demonstrate being available to God in His Spirit? What's filling you today? Are you filled with the Spirit? We need that. Church, we need that. Would you pray with me with eyes closed? If you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus and, and to turn over your heart to to Jesus Christ and to live for Him. I ask you by raising your hand so I can pray with you in just a moment. Would you raise your hand and say, I'm ready to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. And you say, that's me. Pray with me. Pray for me. Raise your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. 
Jesus, today you see hearts that are responding, hands that are responding to you. We thank you that, that you are the one who gives us a second chance. And so we surrender our heart, we surrender our life to you, and we say, have your way. We follow you, we commit to following you and living a devoted life. And today, God, those of us here, the rest of us, we need your spirit once again. Begin to pray that, church. Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, fill us. Overflowing once again. With that power, with that authority, but that effectiveness in everyday life like Barnabas did. God, would you fill us with your spirits? Would you stand with me to, today as we sing this song? Would you make this your prayer? Begin to ask God once again to be filled with the Spirit. If you've never been filled with the Spirit, it's as simple as that. Say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Jesus, would you fill me with more of you? Make room in your heart and in your life for more of Jesus in your heart as we sing, as we pray. Holy Spirit, fill us.